My main hope is that the will of the people is not ignored and that it's the people who should be the main actors and whose hopes, ideas should be at the forefront. That's the voice of Dr. Togson Kasyanova, a senior fellow with Pisces at the Center for Policy Research at SUNY Albany. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Nuclear Policy Program at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She's the author of the new book, Atomic Step, How Kazakhstan Gave Up the Bomb. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plasterist Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Michelle Dover. Thanks, Angela, and welcome back to Press the Button. Tom, how'd you enjoy your weekend? Hey, Michelle, great to see you again. It was a good weekend. It was very quiet, hanging around the house, doing stuff. Typical sort of D.C. winter where it's warm one day and freezing and uh, snowing the next. But it was very nice, very quiet. How was yours? Mine was good. So I know most people watch the Super Bowl, but I have been watching the Formula One controversy. Have you been following this? I have not. Please do tell. Okay, so very quickly, the Formula One World Championship last December, Max Verstappen won over Lewis Hamilton due to a race director's controversial call. I mean, this was like wild. And just over this last weekend, right in advance of Red Bull unveiling the new design for their car, somebody re-released or like amplified this leaked audio from the race where the Red Bull sporting director, Jonathan Wheatley, directly lobbied the race director about this key controversial decision. Turns out the race director like used Wheatley's exact words to justify his decision. So I know it's not super new, but it blew up last week. I cannot get enough of the drama. So anyways, that was my weekend. Fascinating stuff. I just have to ask, have you ever been to a live Formula One race? Not a Formula One race. I've been to a NASCAR race. I've been to several NASCAR races. They are really, really cool. So have you been to a Formula One race? I went to one. It was the loudest experience of my entire life, but it was fascinating. But back to the actual news. From what's going on here at Plowshares, the request for proposals that's due this week, February 15th. The other thing that we want to uplift, it is Black History Month. There is a lot going on in the community. If you have not followed Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security on Twitter, they have a great series honoring Black women trailblazers in foreign policy and national security. If you're looking for a good book, Vincent Intandi has a great one from a couple years ago called African Americans Against the Bomb. We had him on the podcast last year. So if books aren't your thing, definitely take a listen to that episode. And finally, Physicians for Social Responsibility will be holding the final event of their Demand Access series this week on February 16th called Intersectionality in Practice. You heard Mari a few weeks ago. This is the conclusion of that series that she was talking about. So definitely a lot going on and things to check out. Tom, what do you have for us on the nuclear news? Well, the Russia-Ukraine crisis drags on, and I really do feel like it is just dragging on. I'm getting tired of reading about all the military forces that Russia has arrayed around Ukraine. Uh, Warnings of an invasion intensified again this weekend with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan saying an invasion could happen any day now. President Biden spoke with Russian President Putin on Saturday with Biden telling Putin that the U.S. would respond decisively to a Russian escalation. So the saga continues, really nothing new. It's interesting to me, I'm looking at how the Republicans in Washington are responding to this. And you would think in this time of hyper-partisanship, there'd be quite a loud outcry in one direction or another. But in fact, it's, it's surprisingly quiet. You know, you have some politicians calling for tougher action against Russia, but really more along the lines of imposing sanctions sooner instead of waiting for a possible invasion. And then some are calling for uh, Ukraine to not join NATO, essentially agreeing to Russia's demand that uh, that Ukraine not join NATO. But what you're not seeing is calls for U.S. military action against Russia in Ukraine, which I think reflects that the American public really doesn't want to go to war with Russia, which to me is a prudent appreciation of Russian military power and its nuclear arsenal. 
So maybe there's some hope here, maybe some renewed unity on foreign policy. Uh, We shall see. On the Iran front, the talks resumed last week. We're hopeful that progress is being made. We could know this week or next week, in either case very soon, whether a deal will be reached out of Vienna or not, and what kind of deal that might be. If we do get a deal, we will surely have a fight about it in Congress. So we'll be keeping a close eye on that. And so today on Early Warning, we're going to discuss the possible outcomes from Vienna and what that might mean for a conflict in Congress. So please stay tuned. And after that, I sit down with Dr. Togshin Kasyanova, a senior fellow with the Project on International Security, Commerce, and Economic Statecraft at the Center for Polity Research at SUNY Albany. She's also a non-resident fellow at the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We discuss her new book, Atomic Step, How Kazakhstan Gave Up the Bomb. It's a really timely conversation given everything that happened in Kazakhstan over the last month, what's going on in Ukraine now. And as we had had mentioned on the intro last week, it's how the story of Kazakhstan's decision to give up the bomb and pursue a leadership role in nonproliferation in the world was not a guaranteed one or a linear progress. It came as the result of a lot of discussion and debate within the country. Um, And I really also appreciate how she tells the story from the perspective of the people of Kazakhstan and, and what the bomb has done and has meant to them. Very timely book and timely conversation. So I look forward to hearing that. And if you like what you hear, as always, please remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback helps us improve the show. And with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dell. By demonstration negotiators are back in Vienna seeking to revive the 2015 nuclear deal that contained Iran's nuclear program, that is, until President Trump withdrew from the pact in 2018. Reports indicate that the United States and Iran may reach a deal by the end of this month. And this being Washington, the possibility of a deal in Vienna has awoken the political opposition in Congress. For example, a group of 33 Republican senators recently called on the White House to put a renewed Iran deal to a vote in the Senate as a treaty, which would require 67 votes and then essentially doom any possibility of passage. Not to be outdone, pro-diplomacy Democrats, such as Senators Murphy, Markey, and Merkley, have been speaking in favor of reviving the Iran deal. And more than 20 pro-diplomacy organizations, including, full disclosure, Plowshares Fund, released a letter to the administration supporting Biden's efforts to revive the deal. All of this got me wondering what kind of fight we can expect to see in Congress if and when we get a deal out of Vienna. So today, it is my pleasure that we are joined by Sara Hagdusti, who is the executive director of Win Without War. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Sarah, so first walk us through the various possible outcomes from Vienna, which I gather are we could get the same deal, the original Iran deal, a different deal or no deal at all. What are your thoughts on those different possibilities? That's a great question. And of course, talks are going on in Vienna as we speak. So There's a chance that by the time people are listening to this, that we already know the outcome. That said, the best and cleanest outcome is that all parties, particularly the United States and Iran, agree to come fully back into compliance with the JCPOA, or the original Iran deal, and have an agreed upon path to do that as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, there is also the possibility that despite the progress we're seeing and the optimism we're hearing, that the talks collapse and we enter an incredibly dangerous new phase of this crisis. And as you mentioned, finally, while it's looking less likely, it is possible that negotiators agree to some sort of interim deal or something short of a full return to the JCPOA to give themselves more time to work out next steps. And 
While all of this is playing out, I think it's incredibly crucial to remember that Iran's nuclear program is growing. We remain dangerously close to war. And most importantly, everyday people in Iran are suffering tremendously under the double challenge of both an incredibly oppressive regime and really harsh impacts of U.S. sanctions. And now based on those different possibilities, what do you see as the battle lines in Congress if we get a deal? And do you think there will be a vote at all? Well, let me start by saying that I would hope that after decades of failure from our endless wars, Congress would be jumping at the chance to support diplomatic breakthroughs that help prevent another tremendous crisis in the Middle East. Sadly, we know that U.S. Congress isn't where most of us look to for rational policymaking or common sense at some points. That said, as listeners of this podcast probably know, Congress has created a process to review nuclear agreements with Iran back when the JCPOA was originally created. And of course, the JCPOA has already gone through such a review. Simply coming back into compliance with it would not likely trigger any new congressional action. That said... Republicans in Congress and a small number of hawkish Democrats like Senator Bob Menendez have indicated that they may well try to undermine any deal that comes through Congress. The good news is that the overwhelming majority of Democrats continue to support President Biden on keeping his campaign promise to resolve this crisis through diplomacy. And they do that not just because it's popular with Democratic voters but it is popular across the political spectrum. No one wants to see another war in the Middle East. And ultimately, I'm confident that pro-diplomacy forces, if necessary, will turn out and we can ultimately win any votes we need in Congress to defend this deal. Now, finally, Win Without War was also one of the signatories of the pro-diplomacy letter. Can you explain why Win Without War supports the Iran deal and what should people be doing to help build support in Washington? Supporting diplomacy with Iran for us is common sense. It's an absolute no-brainer. And the reason there is the JCPOA worked exactly like it was meant to. It has been the only thing we've seen actually help resolve this crisis. And it was working until Donald Trump unilaterally walked away from it. Trump's reckless and dangerous policy brought us to the brink of war with Iran multiple times, led to Iran's nuclear program accelerating, and importantly, also add to incredible amounts of suffering for people in Iran in the midst of a really horrific global pandemic. The only path forward to resolving this crisis is through diplomacy, and we, like many others, are doing everything we can to support it. And the biggest thing that people need to do is make sure their voices are heard loud and clear in the halls of Congress. The pro-war interests are definitely not shying away from having their voices heard. And the good news is that fundamentally, there's more of us than there is of them. And the only way we could lose on this is if the people who believe in diplomacy don't show up. And from the conversations I'm having and seeing with activists around this country, I'm very optimistic that that's not going to happen. Sara, thank you so much for your time, and I wish you the best with all your work. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, I'm Bonnie Fisk, Deputy Director of Development at Plowshares Fund and a Press the Button listener. When I first joined Plowshares Fund back in 2018, I didn't know anything about nuclear weapons. I came here with just the motivation to help create a safer world and a commitment to lifelong learning. My colleagues told me they'd teach me everything I need to know, and did they ever. Still do, actually. As I continue to grow ever more committed to Plowshares Fund and the reduction and elimination of nuclear weapons, I found that I rely on Press the Button so much. It's a resource for the latest analysis and a place where I can drop in fully, without distractions, and gain new insight into this issue I've come to know and love. 
I find inspiration from the weekly guests and our partners, and I know I'm a better contributor to our cause just by tuning in. Please consider supporting Plowshares Fund and helping make Press the Button possible by making a donation today. Visit plowshares.org slash donate today. And thanks for listening. Dr. Togshin Kasyanova is a senior fellow with the Project on International Security, Commerce, and Economic Statecraft at the Center for Policy Research at SUNY Albany. She's also a non-resident fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Born and raised in Almaty, she is the author of the new book, Atomic Step, How Kazakhstan Gave Up the Bomb. Tagshin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk with you about my book. First of all, and I've been looking forward to this for months since you put out the gorgeous cover on Twitter. And for all of you who don't already follow her on Twitter, you absolutely should. Just to set this up for our listeners, this book taught me so much about the history of Kazakhstan, the role it plays in the nuclear non-proliferation world. And I think what I really most enjoyed about it was it's written from your perspective as someone who knows and loves Kazakhstan and also thinks critically about where things went well, where things could have gone better. And it really gave me a deeper understanding of what's happened. What did you learn in the course of writing this book? Michelle, thank you. You're one of the first readers of the book. And so any feedback or any reaction, especially at this earliest stage, is just so special. And thank you for taking the time to read it. I think the fact that I am from Kazakhstan and that I love my land, my country and the people was both a blessing, but also a challenge because as a scholar, I had to keep my objectivity intact to the extent possible, but it was definitely an an emotional journey and I'll be the first to admit it. At the same time, I think that true love for your country should come from the place where you can objectively see the shortcomings as well and not being afraid to talk about them. And so that's what I was trying to do. In terms of what I've learned as I was researching this book and writing it, and it was a very long process, I think one of the discoveries for me was the similarities and the parallels of Kazakhstan's experience or the experience of how the Soviet nuclear program was set up with the programs of other nuclear powers. And even some vocabulary was similar. For example, when I look at how decisions were made about where to test nuclear weapons of other nuclear powers, the language just reminds me so much of the Soviet documents and how they discussed it in a a way that was almost dehumanizing and that didn't take into consideration the local people. And that's what I noticed in the work of my colleagues who are writing about experiences of other nuclear testing program. I think what I didn't fully recognize before I started writing my book was the sacrifice of the scientists and those first pioneers who were brought in to build the nuclear test inside. So here it's something that I've learned to appreciate as I was researching it, because initially my main concern was with the people of Kazakhstan. But then as I read the archival material and the memoirs of those who were building the site or the scientists, I also appreciated their sacrifice. You know, you've read the book and you know that the second part is moving into more recent history after the Soviet collapse and it's devoted more to nuclear diplomacy and the issues of denuclearization, disarmament and non-proliferation. And and here, I think the pleasant surprise was about the role of scientists and the role of technical experts And just people on the ground, you know, how often they would be the ones driving their governments. And and I'm specifically talking about 
people from Kazakhstan, Russia, and the United States, how often they would be the ones pushing their governments to go even deeper, right? And when we're talking about the projects, uh, most of which were very sensitive, and it was those human connections and trust built at the ground level that was just so important. <laughs> and here I wanted to mention a, a story which I think just shows the humanity of it all. In the chapter in which I described the secret U.S. Kazakh operation to remove almost 600 kilograms of highly enriched uranium from one of the facilities in Kazakhstan to Oak Ridge, there is an episode how American project participants, for some of them first time abroad, obviously first time in Central Asia or in Kazakhstan, and how they would invite for coffee or share coffee with some of the facility workers. And at the same time, the local workers would bring them pickled vegetables, which is like a staple in the former Soviet Union. Or sometimes they would bring them some fish soup and stuff like that. And often they wouldn't even be able to speak the same language. But I think I love the humanity that was present at every level, going from the ground through the ranks and to the high level. Going back to the point you made about the commonalities, I did not realize how truly each of the nuclear weapon states, when they talk about where they selected testing sites, you know, exactly as you say, it's the language of the officials are talking about these deserted lands. And they're actually the home of indigenous people who've been there for centuries and have a deep culture, way of life that's completely upended. And I really appreciated that you started and ended the book with their stories. And, and I think the other piece, too, that I, I was really struck by, and this is coming from growing up near one of the nuclear weapon sites in the U.S., is it was really haunting to see just how much similarity there is in the lack of data about what the impacts were on human health and on the environment and how difficult it is to get a sense today of the scale of it because these official decisions were taken not to collect it. And so I, I really appreciated the way that you're able to go into the archives and find what exists and actually translate it and, and bring it forward. But that was something I found I found really just striking in, in how it's very similar. You're so right. And I guess this is what truly made my blood boil, just the effort to suppress any information or this official narrative that nuclear tests didn't harm at all local people and denial of contamination, even though now in the archives it's possible to find internal documents that the military establishment would share within the establishment, which would say that actually, yes, the radioactivity levels are much higher, but then the same, the same names, the same officials would be sending letters to the local governor saying, no, no, everything is fine. And why are you panicking? And, you know, something that you've mentioned that they were not interested in terms of people's health. And it's, it's true that nobody was treating people for these diseases and nobody wanted the information to be in the open. But what I find almost disturbing is that some monitoring was done, but it was done only again for the sake of the military, military program in order to understand how radiation impacts humans so that this was important data for military planning. And you've read an episode in the book which describes this clinic in Semipalatinsk, which was disguised as an anti-brucellosis clinic. And they did a study on 10,000 people living near the testing site and then 10,000 from control area from further away. And that clinic had 10, 15 hospital beds. So that just shows that if any monitoring was happening, it was only done for a specific purpose, not in order to provide information to healthcare professionals or to people. And then getting to the, the point you were talking about, that, you know, the second half of the book, and, and this is where I'm a negotiation nerd. So <laughs> these stories of like, I'm always curious, how do you get to yes? Now, the traditional narrative, I think that I have heard in working in the nuclear policy field is that, you know, 
Soviet Union fell. Kazakhstan said, great, we're going to give up our nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Look, isn't that easy? You know, yes, yes, look at this Project Sapphire of getting the things out. But, you know, Mm -hmm. there was a a strong sense that this was, it was almost a fait accompli, that this was going to happen. But your book really dives below the surface and, and that wasn't the case. Can you tell us more about what that traditional narrative misunderstands about the situation? The fact that the narrative is so linear, right, and it's all like celebration, that was one of my main motivations as a scholar to provide a more nuanced account. And this is where the beauty and the luxury and the freedom of a scholar comes in because, you know, I didn't have to get myself attached to any predetermined narrative. I understood that the situation was more complex and more nuanced and I wanted to study it and to to see what really happened. I think the narrative is linear or simplified for a few reasons. On the Kazakhstan side, there was quite a bit of personalization going on. Everything in the nuclear field was very much attached to the name of the first president, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, and to a large extent, justly so, because he was the president for the first 30 years, and he was the president and and obviously the key decision maker during the most important point in our history for the, you know, on the nuclear side of things when these decisions were made. But I think this extreme personalization or making a story very linear and simple, I don't think it's right for the record of history. The linear narrative is the result only of, you know, how the story is presented within Kazakhstan or by Kazakhstan. I've noticed that with the US policymakers too, that when I was interviewing former officials, for example, or really people who were part of the actual negotiations with the Kazakh policymakers, and they would remember it as something very straightforward. You know, they would often say, we didn't worry about Kazakhstan at all. Kazakhstan did the right thing from the very beginning and everything was fine and everything was great. And then I would go back to the same diplomats and I would say oh you know by the way I found these cables that you wrote in the early for example 1992 and you sounded pretty worried and they would be so interested themselves and I think so it's also partly because it's just human nature that with time our memories they focus on the positive outcomes which in Kazakhstan's case was a very laudable positive outcome but as a scholar I think Talking about complexity and showing a nuanced story, it only makes the final result even more worthy. And so that's kind of where I come in from my storyline, which maybe is a little bit messier, (laughs) but I, I hope it's more nuanced and I think it does more justice to the history of my country. Another thing which I think is important, it's the strategic decision of Kazakhstan is important not only and not as much about the weapons themselves, because um, Kazakhstan didn't have access to command and control. I think an even bigger story that Kazakhstan made a strategic decision on nuclear material that remained in Kazakhstan and on all the critical nuclear infrastructures that was also available. So, you know, while even the title of my book focuses kind of the bomb, right? And And I think Mostly in our field, we talk about all the weapons, but it's super important that there was also material in the infrastructure and that decision, what made about all these components were valuable. Exactly as you say, it was this decision to pursue a different path completely. It's not just about the technology. It's about the decision of what the country sees as as bringing itself security and what it's going to invest in and pursue to achieve that. And and so I think with that, you know, I, I was curious how you think now about Kazakhstan's role in both non-proliferation and disarmament efforts. That's one 
it's not the only, but I think that's the component of Kazakhstan's foreign policy that I'm most proud of and where I think the record is exemplary. Again, with a caveat that, you know, for me as somebody who is not a diplomat, right, <laughs> and never worked for any government, for me, how sometimes our nuclear policy is presented is a little bit, again, too personalized, too attached to specific names. Having said that, I want to reiterate that I think the policy itself is truly sincere. And the history can explain that. It's because there is legacy of the Soviet nuclear test. It, it's because the society is, is very uh, anti-nuclear. It is because how the country and its leadership sees the country is as, you know, as a constructive member of the international community. We do have it as a as part of our national identity and that, you know, we are between different cultures and different countries, different continents, that we have this almost responsibility <laughs> to be a country that is contributing to common good rather than creating concern for others. So in that sense, I think it's really sincere and nation-driven effort. And I think it's important that Kazakhstan has the expertise and the infrastructure that can make a practical, tangible contribution. For example, with the former nuclear testing site, I really like how one of the prominent nuclear scientists from Kazakhstan described it. There, and he said, you know, obviously there is a lot of trauma and tragedy associated with the testing site, but it is also an engineering marvel. It's a masterpiece of engineering, and now we can use it to do something that is useful for international security. And so it really, I love the fact that the former nuclear testing site is now used for exercises in support of the verification regime of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty on many other very specific projects or initiatives it's important that Kazakhstan has the expertise and the infrastructure and that it's trying to put them to good use. If before people were the object of nuclear politics, now they were reclaiming their agency. Picking up on that agency piece, and, and clearly, you know, as you've, you've written it, how you bring forward the stories and actions of the people of Kazakhstan, how does it feel? to have your book launch at such a critical moment for the people of Kazakhstan? I should start by saying that now is, is a very, I think, difficult moment for anyone who is from Kazakhstan, has traveled to Kazakhstan, knows it or loves it or has friends and family there. It's a very difficult and traumatic moment. Speaking for myself, I'm definitely with those in Kazakhstan who are expecting and demanding more political freedom and more equity. When it comes to the themes of my book and how they touch or just the position with what is happening now, there are definitely some threads, I think, in my book that became even more relevant, even in my own mind, just to give a few examples. For example, my book is almost like a story of Kazakhstan and its beginning. And there is a lot about the first president and his role in the initial state building and the role of the statesman. It was mostly men, <laughs> unfortunately. And it's a good story. You know, one thing I felt, one emotion I felt about the early 90s and as I was reading the transcripts of the negotiations, I felt a sense of pride. You know, that those were really people who worried about the sovereignty of their country, who were trying to build a new nation and who tried to negotiate on equal footing with the superpower and so on. I feel that that beginning in the early 90s and the president Nazarbayev of the early 90s, it's the beginning of a good story. And what we're seeing now with the protests and with the very strong demand for the first president not to be present in the politics of Kazakhstan. It's almost as though it's a bookend of a political career. And 
as a scholar, again, I just hope that we don't go to the other extreme and do not start erasing the good deeds and the good decisions that were made in the early 90s. And I think partly his tragedy as a statesman is that he hasn't left when it was his time to leave. Another component you probably saw from the news that there was a lot of concern and criticism within Kazakhstan when the current president invited the military of a collective defense mechanism that Kazakhstan is part of and foreign troops, including Russian troops, arrived to Kazakhstan to help during the crisis. And and I think for anybody who knows anything about Kazakhstan's history, and even from my nuclear focus book, it will be clear why there was such concern. People of Kazakhstan, I think we are pretty sensitive about sovereignty. You know, we are a new country, and that's why having any foreign military uh, on Kazakhstan's land could have such a strong reaction uh, from the public. And I would add my answer to your question by, again, going back to people. And I think what comes out in my book is the power of the people and how, for example, 40 years they were suffering from nuclear tests. And then finally, all this anger kind of broke through, right? And this huge anti-nuclear movement just swept away, in a way, the military establishment and the, and the testing site was shut down. And I feel that we're observing something similar in Kazakhstan right now as well, that It's a society in which dissent is controlled and suppressed and protest movements had very narrow space to express themselves. And then suddenly, you know, a moment comes up and and you have this very vocal say of the public, of the people. And so, yeah, these are some of the emotions I'm feeling and some of the parallels that I see between my book and what's happening right now. And For me, again, my main hope is that the will of the people is not ignored and that it's the people who should be the main actors and whose hopes, ideas should be at the forefront and it shouldn't be about political elites and, and big politics or diplomacy. Speaking as someone who is not as familiar Kazakhstan story. I know reading this book as these events have unfolded, it really drove home for me where some of the seeds lie or where some of the key historical moments that are eating into those concerns lie. To say it was timely (laughs) would be an understatement. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing, I'm sure, quite a few events. And now that the book has launched and you're hearing from people who are, are reading it for the first time, And how is that helping you relive the process of research and writing? When you think back, like, what is it bringing forward as the most striking, memorable moment for you as you wrote this book? So the book will officially launch in less than a month on February 15th. And everybody is invited to an event that will be hosted, virtual event that will be hosted by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I've just heard from some of, my, some of my friends and colleagues that pre-orders started shipping. So I think soon I'll start hearing from the readers. So far, I've heard, you know, from people like yourself or reviewers who started getting some earlier copies. And I think this moment is just so special for me. It's as though that when the book truly launches and it's out there, that it will have a life of its own. I've done my part and now it will live <laughs> its own independent life. When I look back at the process and my long journey, first of all, I think sometimes I cannot fully understand or explain even to myself how I did it <laughs> and in what kind of zone, on what, what kind of wave I was riding that uh, I actually somehow was drawn to do it. When I look back also, I think about the people. I think for me, you know, the most important part of all of this was meeting the people and first and foremost, the survivors of nuclear tests, those people who still live near the former nuclear testing site, 
their resilience, their grace. I've just felt such affinity for my land and the people when I started traveling to those villages and rural areas. I'm embarrassed to admit I don't speak Kazakh because I grew up when Kazakh wasn't spoken in big cities. And so working on this book and traveling to these rural areas made me finally commit to learning Kazakh. (laughs) That's one development. And yeah, so I, I would say people, people near the former testing site, project managers, diplomats, policymakers, all of them had, you know, something about them that just made it so worth it for me. Just every time I would speak to anyone for my book, I would feel so inspired. I would learn something. I would just see the passion in their eyes. It just makes you so happy to see people who feel that they were part of something important and who carry these good memories and pride about the work done. And on this podcast, we are all about the people. So before we close out, I just want to give a birthday shout out to your mom, Ragna, whose birthday is on the 13th. So this podcast is going live on the 14th. And then the book is going live on the 15th. It is quite the week for you. Happy birthday. You must be incredibly proud because this really is a fabulous, fabulous book. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you. My mom will be thrilled to hear such a special shout out from your podcast. Such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. And thank you again for reading my book. And one last thing, now that we've hyped it, where can listeners go to get their copy? I am a big believer in independent bookstores and indie publishers. And so my first recommendation would be to go to Stanford University Press website because that's where you can use a special 20% discount code. It's my last name. And then 20, Kasenova, 20. If you are not in Americas, there is a website from Combined Academic Publishing. So if you look on their website, you'll also have good options for ordering the book, any independent bookstore, your favorite bookstores, and any online publisher and retail store. Well, they're definitely going to have to check it out. Thank you so much for coming on, and we can't wait to have you back. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited in Washington, D.C. by Lauren Billett and Angela Kelly. And in San Francisco, by Jacqueline Shing from Delphine Vision. With research and assistance from Alex Hall, Harry Tarpey, and Desiree Zepetis. Audio engineering and sound design by Jacqueline Shing. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue, and support our work, visit plowshares.org.